I'm so excited that we could yeah. make this happen. I know we could make it happen remotely, but it's just such a joy to see you in person. Which was a priority for me because we have been friends a long time. I was thinking about it this morning. 20 years, 25 yeah. years, maybe something crazy like that. I was brand new in the years. television scene. I remember when I first met you. It was you know. and your sister. Yes. And we, and I came to watch you. Maybe we were even filming as part of a sh show I was doing to watch you on Love Lines with Adam. Oh, my God. How funny. And we were we were filming that that TV show then? You were doing the radio show. The radio show. show. Yeah, that makes and sense. And I remember... Yeah this call and I was just like sitting in and watching the two of you and then and listening obviously and this caller called in that was asking about a relationship issue and you immediately said I mean she'd barely gotten her question out and you immediately said you've been sexually abused haven't you yeah so I would I would literally have a bodily reaction right. I could just eat you start you know this is an important point to start with is that you know real listening is not with your ears it's with your whole body yes and, and I know you know in a therapeutic context, you can get all kinds of crazy reactions and hear things and smell things. And you can kind of learn through time and experience what's mine or yours in your yeah. case and what's the patient's, <laughs> what's coming at me. Yeah, but and not when, everyone does that and not all clinicians do that. I know. And if you stay in the world of CBT and stuff, though, though even that can be done with proper attunement. Yes. But generally that's not taught anymore. And I didn't learn that. So when you did that, mm. when you said that, I was I, I you probably don't even remember this, but I was like, what? How did you know that? And you're like, I just know. And it wasn't until years later because up until that point I would certainly have an intuitive sense when I was working one-on-one -on -one with yeah. someone yeah. and I wasn't doing what you had been doing for years by then which was kind of this coaching counseling therapy can't really call it therapy on air no not therapy right? it was just sort of it was just sort of explicating, explicating really what I was educating right. but but there was another layer to what I was doing that that really tuned my body up well first of all as I was in therapy myself yeah yeah so I was the object of that kind yes. of attunement and that that teaches you something yes. about about how that works. So I was in therapy for 10 years and it was the greatest experience. But alongside of that, I was dealing with drug addicts every day. Yes. And with drug addicts, you literally have to listen without your ears. Yeah, I mean, you have to talk you have to hear what they're saying, but yeah, it's all bullshit. And so it's just all obfuscation and nonsense and and I would things would come out of my mouth working with patients where I would trust my feeling and things that would just come out of my mouth would shock the patient yes and you and me <laughs> sometimes thing. i was like oh oh no oh my god what have i done where did that and, come and from and then it works yeah. and then it's it because the patient particularly drug addicts that when you when you say something no matter how harsh if it's something real they know it too yeah, and they, they feel, feel understood it. they feel understood and, and even though it might have through the bullshit yes and the bullshit is what scares them because yeah. they can't even tell when they're bullshitting yeah. anymore and and it's what keeps their drug addict you know the stuff going and to have somebody see them and feel them. So being seen, being felt is a really important experience for people, for yeah, humans. For everyone. For everyone. But especially drug addicts who are way a million miles from all that. You wouldn't call so. it this probably, but it is a form of psychic yeah. ability. Oh, 100%. And, and I always say, because I do the same thing, and it always freaks now at this, you know, for several years now, but it really didn't start until I was doing radio every single day, talking to people, because it was a very different thing than you're how I'd listening. been trained clinically, yeah, you know? listening so intently. Yeah, and I remember listening. this intuitive, I'd never really even met an intuitive at the time. This must have been 15 years ago. And this intuitive, who's turned out to be a good friend of mine, Robert O'Hara, an intuitive life strategist came on my Oprah radio show and he was he said okay we're gonna read people and people were calling and he was doing the reading and then I was getting the same thing he was getting and I finally said wait I think I might be an intuitive too and well, he's like and, you are and, and let's frame it our aware conscious brain yeah. is only taking a narrow piece of reality yes. so you, it's, it's designed evolutionarily to do a specific thing help us survive, predict the future, make sense of things, problem solve. But it doesn't It doesn't get everything. No. And interpersonally, there's so much stuff that goes back and forth that our frontal lobes are not aware of, but our bodies are aware of. Yes. I mean, we have these huge, you know, people call them chakras, but they're yes. these big plexi of, of parasympathetic nerves. And we've got a huge sympathetic system along our spinal column. We don't know why it's organized that way. We don't really know what it's doing. We kind of know what the the downstream effects in sort of 
the e, what we call the efferent effects are in the body. Yeah. But what's coming back to the brain, which is the, the case of the vagal, vagal nerve, which is the main parasympathetic yeah, yeah, yeah. input to the brain, it's like 80% coming in. Yeah. Now, we, I was always trained in medical school that it's just something that slows the yeah, heart down yeah, and yeah, affects yeah. acid production but in the stomach. But not that it's an information source. An information source. Yes. And how that information is informing our body, we don't know. And it doesn't just tell you something's off, something's right, something's wrong. It literally, like you said, something comes out of your mouth. <laughs> yes, yes. But what, I, what I'll do, what I'll do, that, that's a, that's, I don't recommend that no. to people, by the way. That's a therapeutic thing you have to develop. But because but, you can get yourself in real trouble yeah, with that. Yeah. I, I will say, though, the, the thing you can do, anybody can do, is if you feel something in your body, like you have a, a, a weird pain yeah, yeah. or you hear a music or smell something and you're in an intense conversation with somebody, it's always fair to go, you know, I'm having an experience. I'm yeah. wondering if it's meaningful to you. And you'll be shocked at what yeah, people at say. Yeah, at what back. people say. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing. You're psychic, Doctor Drew. No, it's not. I don't. I want to. I don't want to make it seem like that. But I. But I believe. You're I suspect too. that psychics call upon the same yes, thing. Yes, they do. Well, I think we're all psychic. And what has started to happen for me over the past decade or so is that I call it seeing the point of fracture. I'll be taught working with someone either in person or on the online or remotely or even when they call into my show, mm. and it's like I can just after a few seconds and so I can see like I'll see a scene or have a sense of where their core wound started and I'll know that their father abandoned them interesting yeah. that you actually see something which is again the patient the person is kind of putting that there yes, interpersonally yes. so to speak I don't mean it's some weird oh, they're not even weird. conscious they're doing they're it. not conscious they're doing yeah. it my thing back what you saw me do i would i would often have my eyes closed and i would see that person person at the age that they were they sounded like to me yeah like if they sounded like an eight year old they sounded like a six year old yeah and that kind of developmental arrest amongst the group we were talking to yeah, at the time you knew was caused by sexual yeah. abuse. Yeah. So. Yeah. And Adam knew it too. He got good at it yeah. too. He, well, he, he sort of knew all the earmarks. Yeah. He wouldn't have the kind of clarity that I did, but he kind yes. of knew the you know what was happening. Well, well, we you, were always right, to be fair. We weren't a hundred percent right, but we were about eighty five percent right. right. Yeah. And then the other thing you were doing that I've never forgotten, because I, I think about it all the time in my own life and with the people I work with, this is kind of a segue, but still interesting, is that you had me fill out a questionnaire. You like I'm doing this little study. Oh yeah. Remember? I remember you were part of that. But... And you f discovered that people who were doing i tell me if i'm saying this correctly but the people who were in front of the camera like yes. doing media work yes had certain <laughs> elements yes. of narcissistic personality disorder yes. which makes total sense because if yes. you want to be in front you know you like the grandiosity yeah. of being on camera and, you and know? So, so and we broke it down into different categories and uh the worst the most severely like overtly narcissist were a reality show <laughs> people particularly <laughs> female reality i can imagine and people that had a skill set that they were using in front of the camera were the least it was like a right. news broadcaster yes. a cellist somebody still had some more than average right but because that's what motivated it of course yeah. there'd be some motivation from somewhere but it was not pure narcissism it was also no. using you know the the that impulse to either uh, share their craft or make a difference and yeah. when and people stayed in the make a different zone, not just, hey, it's me, Yeah, the narcissism was down. Okay, so that was probably me. I do think it's really important. I talk about this all the time because you hear so much, mm -hmm. you know, people are making their careers around bash, especially on social media, around bashing narcissists and the narcissist no, clients. No, 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 yeah. That, that, and I, that it, there's a, first of all, there's a continuum and probably... I don't know, you can tell me, but it seems to me like a huge proportion of us fit somewhere in that continuum and a little bit of, ha a little teeny bit of narcissism ain't a bad thing. Okay, so, correct. And so the way I explain what you're talking about, so I started working in psychiatric hospital in 1985. When I arrived there, there was a admission sheet and would have, you know, five different entrants, axis one, axis two, axis two was the personality disorder. Yeah. And there were people there, chronic patients, there were acute patients, there was a whole range of stuff there in those days. And the axis two diagnoses were all over the place, everything yeah. you could imagine. Yeah. And about 1988, I noticed all of a sudden borderlines started being the predominant thing in the women. And then by the early 90s, everybody, and I mean everybody, <laughs> a was cluster B. Yeah. So it's borderline disorder, narcissist disorder, antisocial or sociopathic, yeah. whatever. 
everybody. Yeah. And it never changed. It's been that way ever since. And so I watched it evolve and I thought, oh, this is something. And that's why I started looking into it. And to be to your point, there's no such thing as a particularly personality construct that doesn't have some asset to yeah. it. And don't look at everything as purely negative. There, there's it's even even psychopaths can be pro-social psychopaths and yeah. can be very effective. It's it's when the negative part, the it's the liabilities of this disorder that people complain about. Yeah. So lack of empathy aggression, exploitation, when those elements come in, that's not okay. Yeah. It's not fun to yeah. be a part no, of that. But but to be a narcissist per se can be very fun to be around, can be exciting to be around. There can yeah. be some real qualities that are good. And no one suffers more than the people with the cluster P disorder. Yeah. They're very empty on the inside. They have a lot of you know, dysregulation and, and they're using the environment to try to feel better which of course is you know a never ending proposition. So what would you say cuz I think this is a really important conversation part piece of the conversation for people because it is so in yeah. the front of people's minds yeah. and we want you know obviously there's always that intention to educate people if you are in a relationship you know it, it helps to know that you're in a relationship yeah. with a narcissist because then you can either get out of it or yeah. help them get help or whatever or or, or adjust or you know adjust. sort of you know sort of adjust your expectations of that yeah. person they're limited. Yes and so and if that person, by the way, is a fighter pilot, uh, you don't want to change that narcissism that much. You want that person kind of being that way when they're flying into enemy, you mean ter enemy territory. Feeling really confident, feeling uh, bigger and, than life, and really, really yeah. confident. You don't want to mess with that if yeah. that's his or her job. And then you can kind of, you know, raise awareness, deal with the liabilities of it, and it's it's when it becomes bad. At what point, like, where's the tipping point for someone who's, let's say, in a relationship with yeah. a narcissist, and they are thinking they they've been reading yeah. the articles it, and watching the blog, reading right. the blog. And they think, oh, okay, here's the problem. He I, or she is a narcissist. I mean, I, we could frame it a lot of different ways. It could be as simple as unhappiness. If you're unhappy in your relationship and you need the other person to change in order to be happy, well, that's not a good situation. No. But I would first look at yourself, yeah. see if there's something you, because that's the only thing we can change, right? Is yeah, ourselves. Absolutely. And sometimes it's not so much about the person, but about what you guys are doing together. And there may be ways to sort of, still let that person be who they are and diminish some of those some of those proclivities and i think people well you know this too that people that tr and that do are in relationship with narcissists typically tend to be a little bit codependent a little and bit so, <laughs> so so my dad was very narcissistic and so i do very well yeah so i do very well with narcissists all my bosses were narcissists I was, and i i knew it was, i knew it when it was happening yes. and, not, and i enjoyed being that person's chosen one that's yes, how they they make yes, you the best yes. only you can help me yes. they do all these kind of anointing and stuff yes. and i kind of would laugh to myself when it was happening but it but still felt good felt feels good yeah. until we had a difference right. until there was until a you fell from glory not just the, feel, the, the fall from glory came from we had a different set of priorities yeah. and then kaboom and then you got to be ready to do war yeah you got to be ready to really go at it and the the really interesting thing I, you'd appreciate this if you're if your dad was a narcissist the hard part, if you're the codependent, is as soon as you start going to war, they're wounded yes, and hurt, yes. and, and you're so used to taking care of their feelings. Yes, it's really hard that. to do it. I it's know. Really and hard. to figure Isn't out, that funny? But to I mean, somebody who really wishes you harm in this yeah. war, you're still like, oh, I got to take care of it. I know, and you her. make excuses. And and, but I think it wasn't until the end of my dad's life, probably the last couple of years, <laughs> so it was a long life as a codependent with a narcissist. Yeah, yeah. Even though I had sort of dealt with my codependent dependence in so many of my other parts of life, that one, you know, it's a toughie, but boy, did it, he, God bless him. You know, he really, I, as soon as I started, I thought all hell would break loose when I started setting those boundaries and yeah. like holding them firmly. So, well, sometimes they feel uh, contained. Yeah. Sometimes they feel a little better as long as you're not abandoning or leaving or yeah. threatening or, you know, yeah, no, that, no, I wasn't you know, doing any so, of that. I was just like, no, I, you know, that's not okay to talk to me yeah. that way or no, yeah. I'm not going to do that. Yeah. That doesn't, you know, that's not okay to ask. You, me usually to my experience with my own father was what I was met with was confusion. Yeah. They get kind of confused. <laughs> like, what do you mean you wouldn't do that? For, just because yeah. I said so. Yeah. Maybe and, that's what was happening, but it kept him quiet and yeah. he didn't fight with me about it. Yeah. 
and yes. he, so, you know, he begrudgingly So the point is, that's the point. It. I mean, you can have, I, I don't like the, the world we live in where, you know, a certain label, you're all bad. Yeah, just negative. that's what's bothering me I about don't like this that. part no. of the conversation it's just, with it's just a It's just a way of understanding somebody. Yeah. It doesn't mean they're a bad person or a good person. It's just a way that they are fitted in a relationship. And it can be okay even when they have liabilities. Everybody's got liabilities. Everybody has liabilities, yeah. that's for sure. And yeah. everybody has wounds. To me, I like I keep finding myself saying that at least as far as relationships go and friendships and people people that come really close into my life, all I need is for you to be willing to be friends with your shadows. Mm. Like if you aren't. Right. If you're open to me raising the. the, the yeah. The, and just the, like yeah, aware yeah. of your shit. Yes. 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 And you don't have to be perfect at dealing with it. You don't have to have mastered it. I mean, none of no, us. You can laugh it. about it. You can laugh at it. You can acknowledge it. Yeah. But, but someone who isn't, I feel like tends well, to be well, more reactive, so, so that's the world we live in right now, unfortunately, where all that is pervasive, yeah. where we're talking about defense strategies here. We're talking yeah. about, you know, emotional defensive strategies. And what's happening today is, fuck you, yeah. ad hominem attack or projection. Yeah. That okay. seems to be the... So talk so, about that. So it's, it's you're an idiot. You don't know what you're talking about. You're an asshole. Blah, 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 blah. You, you don't have two brain cells. To, yeah. Whatever yeah. it is. They just Who go are ad, you? As soon yeah. as they go ad hominem, you know you've triggered yeah. this, this defense. So Because as opposed to an argument, yeah. they just attack. Okay, yeah. that's one side. And the other side is accusing people of motivational states that are actually that person's. Yeah, projecting, uh, projecting it onto it, you. Which old tons of projection. Yeah. Well, God. this is where cancel culture comes Correct. in. So let's, I mean, let's discuss that for well, a that, minute. Well, this is what I'm talking about. That's yeah. what this is. I kind of, I wrote a book about narcissism out of that study that you, you referenced. And in that book, I wanted to write a chapter about historical antecedents where there'd been predominant narcissism in the population. Mm -hmm. And, or, or at least childhood trauma is what I sort of was looking for, which leads to the narcissism. Yes. I kept really focusing on France and revolutionary France and what was going on. I, I found a couple other instances where, you know, this had happened and always a, a, a mobs break out and those mobs scapegoat every time. M mobs, a, a, aggressive mobs with scapegoating, guillotines. And I kept saying the guillotine, I don't know what's going to happen, but the guillotines are going to come. Yeah. Cancel culture is the is modern the guillotine. guillotine. That's it. Yeah. And it is like you are guilty even if you like until proven innocent and then maybe afterwards and then people then deny it because they feel guilt you're not really canceled you're still working no no people are having horrific experiences yeah. of this can I've, I've talked to so many people whose lives have been turned upside down no yes they managed to make it through those are the ones i'm talking to i'm sure they're those that don't manage to make it through so the guillotine does exist the thing they don't understand about the guillotine is that eventually Everyone goes up. Yeah. You, no one's pure enough. And, eventually, and, and by the way, resentment starts building in and around the people who were guillotined. Yes. They'll pull people up too, yes. or their families were guillotined or whatever. So inevitably, this kind of scapegoating is a terrible process. To me, there's been a continuum kind of point, like with everything that, you know, as people get more anxious and mm. there's been all of this disruption yes. and we're going to talk about some of the COVID effects and the economy yep. and protests and George Floyd and Ahmed Aubrey and all these things and all these injustices coming to light and the election and like there's all these catalysts, so right? Is it just that we're all so freaked out and agitated that in order to get some sort of control, we're moving to the dualistic thinking of like you're either good or bad. And if you don't agree with me or if you don't agree with the politically correct term or if there's the slightest inclination or indication, you, have to be destroyed. you must be destroyed. Yeah. It is us, as people tend to do when stressed, reverting to primitive states. Yeah. It's very primitive. That's what it feels like, like. And when the reality, of course is always somewhere between extremes. It's always a navigation between. It's rarely all this or all that, all black, all white. The reality is a, is a messy it's situation. Great. And when you become primitively preoccupied, you know, the aggression of all type comes out. And then when you have opportunity for mob formation. With social media, which allows for mob. It's a, it's a virtual mob formation, Correct. but it's a mob formation. Yeah. So do you think it's going to get worse before it gets better? I think it's getting better. I'm, that's what my That's what your biggest say. nerve is saying? It's really what my body said, because I wasn't sure I was going to say that. That's what came out of my mouth. Because I think I'm seeing people say things like just this morning, Oh, good, an ad hominem attack. That means 
Okay. I've triggered cognitive dissonance. That's a defense. We're not making an All argument right, so anymore. So we're becoming aware. So P, yeah, the, what, what's freaked me out is that it's taken two years to get here, and yeah. it may take another year and a half before we kind of get to full awareness of what we're doing. But people are beginning to sort of speak the language that you and I are talking about right now, rather than just mo- rather than just gratifying the aggression. Good. Yeah, I think, I think, I, I hope, hope, I pray. I hope it gets better. Well, let's oh talk gosh. because, you know, obviously there isn't an individual on the planet who wasn't affected by the pandemic, whether it was getting ill yourself, mm-hmm. losing someone or someone you love getting ill, shut the lockdowns, businesses, all of it. But what I wanted to talk, you know, what it feels like to me is that there is sort of this not even low grade, I would say medium grade residual anxiety. Oh, for sure. And stress. You hear a lot about the medical aspects and getting over COVID syndrome and the implications of the vaccine. Yes, no vaccine, all of that. But nobody really is talking about the residual anxiety that I see and how it's playing out. And I was wondering if you could speak a little to that. You know, I have no expertise with this, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And there is a construct out there that I'm not advocating for. I'm just raising it as a construct of this idea of the mass formation psychosis, which includes at its core free floating anxiety Mm -hmm. that, and and I think at very minimum, we could say that as long as people feel really unsafe, they will gravitate to to primitive kinds of impulses. That's extremes. Why the in-group out-group stuff is really the really kind of a moment of, of our time. And the 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 guy that developed this mass formation thing had a really interesting observation, which I thought was accurate. Where he said that what you start doing is developing the behavioral strategies of one group or another. Let's just say mask wearing or not mask wearing, yeah. just as a just for a case. And, and the more the sci- the more the information and science and and reality reflects that your particular ritual becomes now a ritual a way of signaling your participation in that group yes the more that dev- dev- gets away from reality the signal the more you cling to those signals ah. so driving in here this morning there was a woman in the car next to me with in the car by herself with a mask that on. always is so and, bizarre and a surgical mask nonetheless not even in in 95 and let, let me be clear on my position all the studies on on large scale mask man- mandates have been negative they have not shown that there's a utility to it probably because the way we do it we eat and we take them off some of that also surgical masks very limited utility they are designed to prevent bacteria from coming out of somebody's mouth into a surgical field bacteria spit not a virus from getting in or a virus from getting out viruses are a whole different matter not to mention the newest incarnations of covid are highly highly aerosolized highly infective way and they come into your eyeballs and and, and breathing into a mask may increase the aerosolization who knows but anyway so protecting other people is a no we can't really do that that doesn't seem to be a thing but you can protect yourself with an n95 mask just like a doctor going into a room with an infectious disease patient you can we put those masks on and they do help protect us with high probability but it must be worn the entire time we yeah, are in exposure. Take it off on the plane for right. meals. That so as soon as you take out. it off, th- yeah. that's not useful. Well, so, anymore, okay. So. so let me ask you this, because I had the same thought this morning, and I didn't want to create drama with him or with the school or anything else. But my son, who's now yeah. a senior in high school, gets an alert from his school because this is what they do now yeah. that someone he was with someone who now has COVID, right. so he's been exposed right. and so their requirement if you have been exposed five days out no you have to wear a mask oh yeah well five. what's interesting is i guess that's better than making everybody else wear a mask and it's better than keeping him home i guess, I guess. but it's like Even a though it's false, just a ritual weird a, ritual sense of correct, security it's correct. like a psychological stress it's like a mind screw it's yeah. kind of like a mani- it's a manipulation well i i don't know i mean i don't think they're it, intentionally it, manipulating right. but it is a manipulation it is people who don't understand the data trying to do something yeah and thank god not keeping them home and not masking yeah everybody else. i would have been really because the real the real strategy them. if they really want to keep people everyone else got to wear an n95 yeah. everybody and, and maybe him too but everybody else for sure so but here's the other thing that's other screwball about this there really does not seem to be a thing, particularly with Omicron, of asymptomatic spread. It does not seem to be a thing. So you have to have symptoms. Symptoms. 
symptoms. Okay. And so even if you no, I'm not saying it, that's categorical, yeah. but generally that's So if you true. had it and you were with someone and you didn't have symptoms. I always feel that people, when we started talking about, I always feel like I need to tell people my training and yeah, pedigree because, training. because people get very confused about what I do. So I'm trained as an internal medicine doctor. So I do everything non-surgical and I was trained as an internist. Is this my camera? Can I talk to people yeah. here? Yeah. So <laughs> I was trained at a time when doctors could, internist could work in the intensive care unit, could do hospital patients and outpatients, which I did. I did a lot of intensive care. I actually was going to go be a cardiologist, but I got sidetracked working at the psychiatric hospital and that became another big part of my career. I'll tell you about in a second. So I'm doing internal medicine. I'm board certified internal medicine. I'm a fellow at the American College of Physician. I became an assistant clinical pre professor of medicine. I taught medicine. All alongside of it, though, and I, and I was, interestingly, when I, I signed up to be a volunteer in the New York Physician sort of uh, volunteer group, mm -hmm. and it was interesting when I went through the interview process for that, they were like, oh, you know how to put an arterial line in? Yeah, I do so all the time. Yeah, you know how to, yeah. you know how to manage a ventilator? Yes, I've done all that. How about shock? Yes, I so do all that. So this was when COVID, and you wanted it, to This help. was COVID. Yeah. I wanted to go to New York to yeah. help. Yeah. And they were asking me about these questions about the things I, and they were like, are you, an, are you a hospitalist? I go, no, I'm a general internist. Yeah. And we used to do people all that. People don't know that. Yeah, yeah. we used they to don't do know that what it all used the to time. Be, and a lot of people don't know that about your history because they know you from the psychiatric Exactly. So that's why I feel side. when we talk about COVID, I have to push yeah. this out. And fellow with the American College of Physicians is a big deal to me. I, I protect that you know, yeah. as much as I can. That's a very high standard. And I was an assistant clinical professor. Then working in the psychiatric hospital, that became much more a part of my life. I became board certified in addiction medicine. And I'm also a fellow with the American Board of Addiction Medicine and um, became an assistant clinical professor of psychiatry. Yeah. So I started teaching addiction through the Department of Psychiatry. So I was, I was doing a lot of stuff. And I was the clinical director of the whole program at the hospital. Very, very, we had a reputation for dealing with the most severely problematic patients, polydiagnosed, seizures, psychiatric, psychotic, yeah. unstable medical problems. We, we could handle it all. And we did really well. We had a good outcome. But anyway, so that's why I can speak. And I've treated hundreds of COVID patients. Yes. Now, I've treated a lot of it. So I have a lot of experience. And people have to understand something. I, I found myself talking a lot lately about the importance of clinical impressions. Everybody's out there on Twitter and everywhere else talking about the data, the data. You're not reading the data. It's like... Oftentimes, the data doesn't keep up with the clinical. No. You, I'm sure you've had this experience where yes. you know the data was treat borderline personality disorder this way, and you're like, mm, I think dialectal behavioral therapy is working, and and the, it takes a year or two for the literature to catch up with that. It does. And and so now that's happening clinically. And uh, for you know, one of the controversial things is ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine. Yeah. I, I think that is so silly to me. These are medicines I've used for decades. Now, when we had nothing to offer, I something. have no quarrel with that. At least people were following their patients and treating them with something. But but now we have Paxlovid and Molnupiravir and monoclonal antibodies. The difference between giving somebody like something like ivermectin, going, mm, I'm not sure it helped. Maybe it helped. Maybe okay, but they probably going to do okay anyway. Versus giving somebody. A, a real therapeutic that we have right now, and they get better the next day. Yeah, I mean, it's and it's every time. You have that experience a few dozen well, times, and you're really like, maybe versus boom, it works right away in dangerous situations too. And I don't think so. most people understand that there are now clinical medical treatments. So many, and they're free for the most part. Yeah. You can get these things, and the government work. purchased them all, and you can get them for free. You get monoclonal antibodies infused in your home, and you can even take pre-exposure prophylaxis with molnupiravir. There's a million things you could do, but doctors have not been treating. It's been yeah. weird. This is what happened from the beginning of COVID. I saw my peers freeze in place and essentially just tell people to go home until they got sick, like dangerously yeah. sick. That is the most extraordinary th thing in the history of medicine. I've never seen anything like that. That was where I yeah, started going. Go home I, and call me when you're really, really Well, that's sick. one of the reasons I became so exercised about this whole thing. I, I just saw the panic yeah. everywhere, destroying things and being the thing that was going to end up being the problem. And I became too aggressive in my saber rattling. And that was a mistake. It was an error. Why? Did uh, people get mad at you? Oh, my goodness. No, I was totally canceled. Did they cancel you? Oh, I still get people physically assaulting me. Out of me. <gasps> you killed my grandma. No. I did not. Your, your, your grandma never heard of me. And I'm sorry she died of COVID. I'm sorry about that. I really, I, it's a dangerous Aww, illness. I'm Kill sorry us. that happened to you. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that's why I, I apologize for where I got things wrong. My impulse was correct, trying yes. to fight the panic back. Yes. I mean, in what world does the press determine medical policy? Never. Uh, it was, a, was, it was an insanity. New York Times editorial boards demanding lockdown. 
who are you? Yeah. That is a medical intervention. What, where did you get that notion from even? So a lot of this stuff was made up out of a whole cloth. The yeah. social distancing, that was made up. Wow. There's no textbook that talks about social distancing. There's no textbook that talks about lockdown either. Yeah. That was made up by the Chinese communist government. And then we... And we adopted it. We adopted it because we thought, oh, it's working there. we got to do the same. Wow. Was, and yeah. this is bringing me up to another point sort of in the coast in the post COVID, in the post COVID um, anxiety realm, yes, which I don't think only applies to COVID. It applies to all the craziness yes. happening in the world yes. right now. The media, right? Like there's fueling it. There, fueling and, and it. In, but then social and, media fuels it too, yeah. and that's sort of an autonomously that's functioning. True. That's not the journalist. That's but what us. drives me crazy, like okay, I get us doing it. Yeah. You know, your average Joe, Jane, whoever yeah. being triggered and or being dualistic in your thinking or or posting from your wounds or whatever. Yeah. But what really freaks me out is the journalists, yes. and it's both sides. You know, if you're watching yes. CNN, yes. they are completely biased and dysfunctional and dualistic in their approach. And on the opposite end, you have Fox, who's doing the same thing in yep. the opposite way. 100%. And all of them are wrong because yes. they're all... Yeah, the, the enemy is the extremes right now. Yeah, what do you say to people? Because obviously we can't, I mean, I sort of do. I've evolved to the point where I live in a vacuum when it comes to the news, and I just ask my my husband to give me the rundown every day, which he graciously does because I get so, I mean, I still see the stuff on social media. You get media. so anxious. I get so anxious, yeah. and I get so angry. Yes, and yeah. But I, I get anxious not for me. Because I can see through it. I get anxious for the millions of people who aren't seeing through it and yeah. what that's going to mean. The, the worst part is to stay siloed in one team or another. Yeah. Because that it very quickly becomes detached from reality. And here's, here's one of the solutions. I uh, was very concerned about this California AB 2098 where doctors are now going to be encumbered, their license revoked for COVID misinformation. That right. was the way the bill's written. That if you deviate from the standard of care you can have your license encumbered. Wow. That's the bill. It's called AB 2098. Physicians are freaking out about I it. Imagine. I was freaking out about it. And mostly because standard of care can often be terrible that doctors need to stand up against mm -hmm. opioid prescribing, something I went through for 10 years telling this is insane. The standard is giving people 90, giving my drug addict patients 90 of Vicodin when mm -hmm. they leave the office. Are you kidding me? This is terrible. You're, you're an opiophobic. Standard of care is <laughs> patient. <laughs> oh, I was called that all the time. You're opiophobic <laughs> and pa know, pa so pain funny. is what the patient says it is and pain controls what the patient says it is. You're old fashioned. You're yes. interested in patients. I was investigating by the Department of Mental Health. It was, wow. it was crazy. That was the standard of care at the time. Yeah. That's how bad standard of care, it can kill people, a lot of people, yeah. and it does. Yes. So not being able to stand up against standard of care lest you be called somebody advocating for misinformation. And who justifies misinformation? Well, who so, determines so I that? tweeted about it, and the president of the Board of Medical Quality Assurance said, I, I, I hope you would understand what, what the spirit of this is, and maybe we could talk about it. I went, great, let's talk. Yeah. I'm, I'm available right now. Let's go. But four hours later, we were on the phone for about an hour. She was a very bright attorney. Her dad, dad's a doctor. She was interested in advocating physicians. She was very reasonable. She listened to my concerns. We talked about this standard of care issue. And uh, she said, look, we already have the authority to do this. That's the reality, which I thought, God, she's right. That's true. Uh, and trust me, we're, this is not going to go the way you guys think it is. It's very different. The point being of the whole story is human contact. Yeah. Make you contact. Didn't, you didn't go off on a tangent and go crazy and refuse. And when that woman reached out to you, said, screw you, and, you're I evil, just said, you're the establishment. I, and I do this all the time when I have physicians that attack me. Yeah. I always find that so weird. Yeah. So I go, let's get on the phone. Yeah. Right? And some of them let's get on the phone and we're it. fine. Some of them will not. And those yeah. people are freaking cowards. You yeah. are a coward if you're not. You're, you're yeah. a peer. We're trying to be collegial. Maybe we'll still disagree, maybe with the same degree of intensity, yes. but at least we'll hear each other out. You're a fucking coward. Coward. Yeah. It's, I don't know if you can no, say that. Okay. You, you are a fucking right. coward if you're not getting on the phone with a peer for fear of yeah. not being able to maintain your your own beliefs, your anger, yeah, not you the beliefs. It's the anger, anger they want to maintain. Right. Right. So anyway, so lots of cowards out there. It turns out I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah. So I walked away from that conversation feeling very reassured. I thanked her publicly for it and stuff, and I really do appreciate it. But this morning, particularly, I started thinking, oh. What happens when she leaves? 
and somebody else comes in and doesn't isn't yes. that yes. reasonable. So your anxiety is bubbling up about it. Yeah, is that, you know yeah. what I mean. You're like the what ifs. Yeah, yes. and I understand. Well, what if? What if it's going to happen? Yeah. She's not always going to be there. Yeah. Maybe I'll be gone by that yeah. point. But but she's going to leave, and yeah. then what? So the, the, this is the world we live in right now. We're, we're we're and why is it? You know, a lot of my anxiety is about the government. Why yeah. should why should I? Be, I just want the government to leave me alone. Why should I yes. be thinking about that? Why should yeah. that be part of our life so much that was not what a republic it's was new. it's not it's, what a republic was meant for i mean for. i know it's happened at other times in history but in our human history has it happened in america before like this i maybe no. in the 20s or something when they I mean, were fighting maybe. communism and stuff maybe yeah they did the yeah. same thing yeah um, but not or in the 50s with, 50s again yeah. yeah so maybe it's time this is a different form of it but i do Ugh. feel the censorship and you know if you look at there are lots of data out there about what um, leads to a quote unquote, not that we're going to become a dictatorship. I'm not at all implying no. that. But if you look at dictatorships, <laughs> yeah, they start by instilling fear, right, and then they use the fear to control and to isolate us from one another and to create this dualistic thinking. So by no means am I saying we're going to I agree but, with you but it, but, but it, this scary. has happened before is the point. Yeah. And we the, you know as uh, Santayana and Churchill both said those who did not study history will live to repeat it. I think what you're saying is that one of the things we can do is just contact contact talk to people who you disagree with. You can still disagree with them after you contact talk to them. Contact is a solution to racism. Yeah. Because when you contact the human being that you've got this stereotype about, suddenly they become a human being, everybody. Yes. The, it, there was a book in the 50s that was trying to wrangle with, deal with racism, and they, it was, the book was called Contact. Because once Aww. they studied it all, they thought that's, that's the solution. But I, right now, it's also the solution to the tribalism. Yes. Right? Yes. And the aggression and the acting out and the defensiveness and all that, just make, make contact. And, uh, and with the contact thing, I'm, I'm segueing here, but it's related to contact. The Ford 12 year olds that were shut down and not going to school for oh my two god. years oh my god right I, I worried about the 8 to 15 year olds that was the group i really, oh, really worried about i don't know why i kept seeing them they looked so miserable and, and i thought that's such a critical developmental phase and oh yeah, yeah, so I'll, know, I'll take it down to four the younger ones like you're learning limits and boundaries and social negotiation Look, and, and social cues and, and this is the piece that everybody does not get that whole thing we open talking about this exchange that happens on a subconscious level yes. between bodies and it also happens on the face yeah and the tiny and the, mask. the tiny muscles of the face are what what trans maybe the whole story yeah. right yeah, but yeah. you have to when we and i are working with the patient we're not looking at their bodies we're focused on, on their, their face. face and they're focused on ours many times yes. too and we are showing a reflection on our face of their emotions. That's that way that people build emotional regulation is through pushing it out to another person. The other person doesn't just verbally reflect it back, but they sees mirror. it on the yeah. mirror of some type. And I was talking to a group of teachers and I was expressing this and I and, I, and they go, what do we do? I go, well, get down on their level and pay, pay close attention to them and focus on their face, let them reflect back. Their, and the one teacher goes, but the mask. I Shit. thought about that every time when I'd be oh. in the grocery store having to wear the mask. And oh. I always look at little babies and look yes. them in the eye and smile at yep. them and have a moment. And I noticed, I was like, oh my God, this little baby can only see my eyes. What oh. is going to happen to it? Not because it can't see my face. We don't face, know. It's never been it tried in history. Yeah. Face. It's not been tried. Yeah. Now, presumably, you know, there is enough time at home when people are without masks to yeah. get some exchange. But it's those older kids, you know, that normally rely, that, where the peer becomes more important than the parent, yeah. where they're not, they're not even being exposed to their peers. The usual no. developmental process just is aborted. And if they are exposed, like my kids were during the pandemic, they are not FaceTiming and, right. and looking at each other. Right. They're playing games and they're not looking at each other's faces and yeah. having an exchange yeah. like they would in school or hanging yep. out together. They are playing their game together as a form of socialization. And I hope people understand now that the population that was clearly at greatest risk from this illness are the elderly. Yeah. And by the way, they're getting the most benefit from the vaccines. I'm super clear about vaccine therapy and over 65. It's very clear benefits there. Clear, clear, clear. And treatment benefit. So these age groups that we could have focused our protection we did a horrible job, and by the way, it subjected them to exposure rather than protection. 
So we we shut everybody down just to really protect this one population yeah. that we did a shitty job of protecting. <laughs> and now we have good treatments and therapeutics and vaccines and stuff for them. Clearly, I, I, the data's not out yet, but I'm clinically, I'm here to tell you, I've seen it, they benefit. Okay. We shifted the burden of protecting people that are at risk to the younger mm -hmm. and the vulnerable, mm -hmm. the at risk, the socially, the economically distressed, we put it all on them. Yeah. And what do we think? What do you think is going to happen? Right. It's so obvious. And yeah. we, I don't know what we, I don't know how we get those people back. I don't know what we do for them. It, yeah. it, and our educational system in many areas is so inadequate to the moment. I, and I, they're all, and when they all came back to school, after if they not, did, if, they, if did, they did, yeah, after not, after being gone for yeah. two years, I, I see the school system, I read the literature and they're like, we're going to come up strategies to deal with this and stuff. Really? Jeez. What's the strategy? What's yeah. the evidence for that strategy? And Where has this it, ever and, happened before? And schools have always been dismal about social. God, we are bummers emotional. today. Are you sure? Is your show always a bummer? <laughs> 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 no, I think it's important to highlight what is going on, yes, you yes. know, but also what we can do about it. Yes. There are all of these problems, right? And the schools are poor, have always sucked at the social mm -hmm. emotional support, you know, supporting the social emotional connection between their students and facilitating that. I'll never forget my, uh, one of my kids, school counselors when he was being really severely bullied and this was like in third fourth grade i wanted her to intervene with the kids and she's like that's just going to make it worse and so she wouldn't wow. intervene and i thought wow if the school counselor is saying if she intervenes like some, it's, it's going to get worse something is really messed up here but as far as like for parents at you know what we can do at home how we can advocate for our kids, support our kids. We're not going to well, change these systems overnight. That's the point. And that, that parent participation in education is always what determines the outcome of education. And uh, everybody's got to step up yeah. and f help their kids focus on them, get the homework done, you know, really d participate. And I, I have a lot of friends that have taught in circumstances that are stress difficult. And they always say when the parents are in, it doesn't matter about the circumstance. It matters that the parents are on top of the kids, that they're engaged, that they're yeah. participating. And if we could get that going, that will make a difference. And so if a parent doesn't know what that means. Correct, which is often the case. Because uh, they weren't we, raised we, we gotta, that we way. we got to get that to them. Yeah, Find so how, what, are, what are ways? I don't know. I, I really, I, <laughs> I, I, I don't, I don't know really. That's a, that yeah. is a almost community by community question. Yeah, but, yeah, but, I, yeah. but if we don't focus on that, we're missing the point. Yeah. Now we'll see if th those strategies that they're talking about include stuff like that. I imagine yeah. it will. I mean, how could it not? Well, to me, it was like in the beginning of COVID, it was really easy, but then they got sick of me. You know, we were playing croquet, like I got these silly croquet kits and we were doing science experiments and we were, you know, playing with dry ice and doing yeah. all kinds of stuff to get cooking and baking yeah. and, and whatever. My youngest and I would just like put a whole bunch of ingredients together and see how it came out. And, you know, they were in probably ninth, 10th grade at this point. So they weren't young, but they were game out of complete boredom. Yes. And then I eventually, as school started, it was starting back up and they weren't going back my rule with them was like, okay, the only way I'm thinking the only way they can socialize is through social media. So I'm not going to limit that. My rule with them was like, look, as long as you're doing well in school and you're getting your work done, this is that you can't go to a football practice. You can't hang out with your friends. You can't go to school. So, okay, go ahead and do as much social media as you want. As, boy, was that a mistake. <laughs> what happened? Well, first of all, I was going to say my friends that work in the field of Adolescents and social media limit their kids to one hour a day. No, these were not limited to one hour a day. And it was their only form. So I felt like I, it was I, yeah, I would have done the same thing. They were unequivocally refused to hang out with me, mm. you know, because they now had they this other thing. They mm. got lost in it. Mm. And it's also now, as I'm sure you know, as, as well as I know all too well. I associated with depression anxiety. and drugs these dealers are now so on the social media when they're hanging out with their friends the dealers are finding them on social media and approaching them and that's what happened to sammy oh. he was on social media all the time talking to his friends 
playing games, whatever, and a drug dealer sent him a really colorful menu where I'll deliver one Percocet for $1 to your door, you know, it was all these different things. And it's not just him, you know, we know it's that, but, but it was counterfeit Percocet uh, and it was, or Xanax or whatever it was he took, we'll never know, but it was pure fentanyl. The leader in, at Singapore, Lee Shun, what's his name? Help me guys, Lee Shun something. President, anyway, it's the guy that really developed Singapore. He said he would like to have drug dealers die a hundred deaths hmm. for not just what they do to the patient, but to the families. And I want to talk to you about this because this is something, I guess it's personal because it pisses me off hmm. when people say that my son died of an overdose hmm. because he died of fentanyl poisoning. Mm -hmm. He did not mean to take fentanyl. Mm -hmm. He did not know he was taking fentanyl. He sure as shit didn't want to die mm -hmm. and didn't want to take too much and was, you know, very careful with his health. Although, you know, he was also a teenager and a good kid and good kids make stupid decisions like we all did. I was wondering what you think about this, because as this fentanyl crisis, I get it that there are lots of recovering addicts. I hear from the thousands of parents. I mean, I have probably like 15,000 parents on my Facebook support group that I had to start because I was hearing from all these parents whose kids have been murdered this way. And it is murder. It's not an overdose. But And many of them were recovering addicts yeah. who had a slip yeah. and thought they were taking an opiate. And yeah. it was fentanyl. Uh, we're losing six a day on the streets here in Los Angeles. Yes. That's murder also. It's murder. Not just what they've been well, exposed to. Well, that's what to, I'm asking. Leaving them out there untreated yes. and being duplicitous and that is also Because that's what they're doing. I've heard this least. story a lot that someone comes out, like the dealer comes, gives them the fentanyl and may even be there when they pass out. Or maybe I've heard from parents whose kids have died that they were with other kids mm. and the, the kids got scared, scared. Happens all the time. and ran away. Mm. And or they left, throw them in the shower and yeah. wait too long and all this bullshit. And, and let them yeah. die. Yeah. And that's a whole other ball of wax. But I just wanted to just get your quick a quick sense from you because you have such tremendous expertise in addiction and substances. Mm -hmm. How do we like change the dialogue that this isn't something that is affecting? Not that we should, you know, I said this to Dr. Phil when I was on his, on his show, I think they edited it out, but he was saying, you know, this is, he was creating the story about Sammy. This was not a kid who was addicted to drugs. This was not, you know, this was a, which is all true, but it kind of bothered me. Cause like, why do we have to clarify that? I'm really bothered by that construct because people have no empathy for drug addicts. Yes. And because somebody have a brain condition or just made a bad choice, it's still inadvertent death due to poison. Yeah, and they think, oh, he did it to himself because he was doing, he was I, a drug I, addict. I know. Because of the addiction is where I, I live, you know, with those, those patients. The piece that everybody misses with addiction, when they advocate for letting people live their best life, I, you know, live, live on the street, do whatever you want, man. Who are you to say? Addiction is a progressive illness that ends in death. Yeah. Period. Period. Whether it's because those addicts get exposed to something like fentanyl that accelerates things or they just get strung out on meth and eventually die, it ends in death and we're losing six a day. And people that prevent, you have out, open air asylums here, right? Yeah. This is a, this is a hospital, it's a hospital filled with patients with no walls and no doctors and no nurses, and they're not allowed to participate until they break into the ER and then they're forced to put them back out on the street. Yeah. If you just put walls around the same people yeah. and said this and is a hospital, a hospital, call it a hospital, but only social workers are allowed in, are you kidding me? These are very complicated brain diseases. Yes. People are terribly ill and they're being exposed to this horrible compound that is accelerating their death. People are taking think they're taking Xanax, they get fentanyl. They think well, they're that's taking that's what happened to my son. Yeah, that's very common. It's yeah. and it's awful. And and our government does not seem to be doing anything about the no. influx. And it's coming in in huge amounts and the meth, even, the meth and the fentanyl that's coming in And France, they're making it in I mean, I just like one drug bust and that's one of a of a million they didn't catch, oh, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. But one drug drug bust, they're finding enough fentanyl to kill everybody in the United States. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just one. Mm -hmm. And it's just pouring in through the through the uh, borders. And then they're even making them in kid-friendly rainbow colors. And I mean, it's really spooky. 
and it's the number one killer of people between 18 and 45 right now. I mean, think about poisoning. that. Think about that. Yeah. And what are we doing about it? Oh, we're leaving them on the streets and we're doing nothing with the supply. Okay. All and right, we're good. doing nothing with social yeah. media regulation and we're doing nothing with the incoming supply. Yeah. So <sighs> it's very, it's, yeah, I have the same exact reaction. Like, I'm so tired of fighting it. I'm yeah. so tired. I, I've been saying so this. So, what do we do with being so tired? I, I guess just keep going. I, I did a, you know, homeless is another fo version thing I've been focusing on. And I did a documentary, I think it's called Beyond Homelessness, if I remember right. And uh, it was for the Salvation Army. And, um, and I was, went to sort of a release of this film at a, at a film festival for them. And the woman that spearheaded it, I said, I, I'm just so tired. I go, what, what is going on? And she goes, yeah. it's a religion. It's a religion in California. You're fighting a religion. What is the religion? The religion is let people do whatever they want to do. Oh, and it's, yeah. and it's nobody's business what anybody does with anything under any circumstances. Yeah. Where you live, what you put in your body, whatever yeah. it is. The idea of a brain disease or a bad or an adolescent development with poor judgment, not something that they would even contemplate as compared to this religion of every man it's not even freedom uber alice right because 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 it's it's in it's weirdly it's weirdly intolerant i mean here's the thing i always say again i'm just looking at the homeless thing why if a demented patient ends up on the street confused talking to himself psychotic and i don't treat that person i'm guiltier of elder abuse but if a schizophrenic is walking around with the exact same symptoms i can't touch him He's yeah. living his best life. Or a drug addict has complete denial and anisognosia, can't see what's happening to him. I can't touch that because that person's doing what they want to do. Yeah. Believe me, when they get better, they are furious with the people that left them in that condition. Yeah, for so long. And those oh are just God. the few that get better. I've hoped for all of them because I've seen people get better that shouldn't get better. And we just got it. You have to do something. You have to yeah. do a treatment. And to do nothing is like just, it's manslaughter in my opinion and it trickles all the way down into young kids making yeah. bad choices yeah which we used to be able to do big bad that, choices yeah yeah didn't have the terrible consequences and, i mean we might worse i mean obviously you could end up addicted which would be a terrible well you know what would end up you would end up with addiction it would end up with accidents fights pregnancies unwanted sexual yeah. contacts and stis uh, yeah that's where it would but go but not death but not death yeah, Unless and the from where this mama this, sits, all of that would have been preferable. Of course. I love you. It's great to see you. <laughs> really, I you love too. hearing your story and your, your sense of things that is very similar to mine, and that's very reassuring. I hope people understand the spirit that we have sort of come across this landscape. It is based on our experience, and uh, you know, we, we, yeah. we do have a bit of training behind us, and we do have maybe something worthwhile that people can learn from. I, I, if, if somehow things we have talked about run afoul of your religion or belief systems or whatever, good, fine, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, okay. I have no, I'm not, no, no I'm in the middle. No offense intended. No offense intended, and I am between the extremes. Uh, and yeah. you know, and more of us need to be there. And, and, and make contact with each other because most of us are there in reality. Yeah. We get spun on one side or the other, it's easy for us to get spooled up. Like I was saying, that AB 2098, I was, I was pretty excited about that when I, before I talked to somebody. And, you know, when you make that contact, it, it, it's a healthier place to yeah, be. It feels and, better, believe me. And no decision made from fear is ever really Panic a Panic never makes things better. It always no. makes things worse. And that's what I knew in the oncoming pandemic. I kept screaming for the press to shut up. Yeah. They're going to make things worse. And they're worse. like, no, we want ratings. We're going to scare the shit out of people. They did. And they continue yeah. to really yes. like they can't, they can't That's the only it. thing that sells. They can't and get until enough we, of the fear of mongering. Until we stop feeding like reinforcing their fear mongering by eating it up and yes, fueling it's, it and it's natural for us to go there to yeah. fight it so here's on the positive focus on the things that you are grateful for yeah we all have a lot to be grateful for yes. i know it feels weird and awful there is a ton to be grateful for yeah far better than 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 we feel like when we go on social media and watch the, the news and things gratitude yeah. one of the things i'm doing is i went to the wadi rum desert in jordan and trained with special ops forces Ooh. it's going to be on fox in january not fox news fox network uh and i was there with 15 other celebrities and we became trauma bonded frankly I bet. <laughs> and we were are now deep friends Aww. and that and that experience of really enjoying these relationships reminded me of that priority yes so let you know make contact with old friends 
focus on your family, make spend some time, ones. make some new friends. And that's what I'm saying. I, that's why I opened with how, what, how much gratitude I have seeing you again yeah. and being here with you. And my admiration and love for you is immense. It's mutual. Uh, and, and so express, and express these things, express love. My, <laughs> my wife last night goes, you never do say I love you anymore. I go, yes, I do. And I go, like when you had your colonoscopy, you, know, you were you were asleep, and I said, and she and she goes and she goes, um, she goes, you, you know, I, I go, you tell, I tell you why, because you always go why. It was she was being funny, but yeah. you go why or no, you don't yeah. that kind of thing. I go, well, I'll, I'll start again. Stop that oh. this morning. No, you don't. Same thing. I went, come on, let's do this. Um, <laughs> Uh, so people have to give and receive love. That's an important yes, part of this. Receive relating. as well mm -hmm. as give. Yes. yes. Uh, and so that's what I'm coaching my wife on that. But gratitude, gratitude, have faith, have some sort of spiritual program. And I would urge you to easy way to find that a service, mm -hmm. service to other people. Uh, and let's do the things that we know work and get back to those basic What's things. What's your spiritual? I mean, you don't have to tell me your religion, but just no, what do you do I, to create that spiritual I, I'm not, connection? I'm not good at it. I'm not good at it. And, and I've always experienced it in context of relating to other people. Yeah. So I try to spend more time doing that. I really feel awe-stricken sometimes by relationships and what I see and feel in other people. Yeah, and, so and I, you I, feel a lot. You you, know. you come across, not right now, but when I've watched you work or when you are you have your clinical hat on, like the rest of us, yeah. you can come across as like stoic, stoically professional, not emotionally stoic, yeah. but as, but you actually are very psychic and spiritual, yes. so, whether you admit it or not. So, so I, you know, you, what you see me on TV doing yeah. oftentimes is, you know, what, radio or whatever, it's, I got to do something fast. Yeah, <laughs> I got to yeah. get to and it. And I'm not trying to do anything except give you a little direction. Uh, on something like celebrity rehab, I have a big job in addition to attuning to them is keeping them contained. Yes, yes. And so you have to be a on track. Yeah, yeah. I've got to contain them yeah. and keep them, and then really judge carefully. They can't. T they're very fragile. They, you know, their brains aren't right for a year. Yeah. And they and, and they can only take so much of the real stuff, and so I have to kind of parse that out into all yeah. the quantities. So. But I don't think people know how about this uh, not that they need to but i want them I would to like them i'm to. announcing I, I I, yeah. <laughs> that dr drew is extremely sweet fuzzy yeah. and very psychic yeah. whether he portrays himself that way or not and i am one of your greatest fans well, and thank i you. thank you so much for being here I, one of my motivations for being here was just to spend time with you so Aww. thank you for that and i would appreciate your uh, guys showing up for me uh on dr drew.tv we do a streaming show tuesday wednesday and thursday at 3 p.m and some of those pacific. days I'm, pacific time yes thank you yeah. and some of those days i'm just taking calls off twitter spaces just answering your Ooh. questions uh, other days like wednesday i have a woman named kelly vickery she's an er doctor in there with me she has very different opinions than i do like she's in her you know she would bristle when i talked about yeah. hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin that kind of thing um but i like that difference yes. and we've been talking to outliers we've been You're talking demonstrating contact correct yes. correct of course vilified for it you know yeah. as i'm giving platform to the end no, I, just, I just want to hear you what they have, have to say contact yeah so mccullough and malone and reesh and all these guys we, we were talking to and, I, and it's hell it's expanded my understanding i've been so confused about what we've just went through yeah. it, it was hard for you to make sense of it and these guys had a certain experience of it where i'm like okay i think jay bhattacharya if you want to look up somebody interesting on twitter he's going to be the poster child for the excesses of that period, the early period of COVID. Mm. This guy's a brilliant epidemiologist, a Stanford professor, and he destroyed him for nothing, mm. for nothing. Also, uh, drdrew.com, I appreciate you there. I do a lot of different podcasts. I do one with Adam Carolla. I do one by myself. I do a YouTube channel over at a place called Your Mom's House. <laughs> which is sort of an incarnation of Loveline and it's sort yeah. of more I interview comedians and things it's a little wilder it's not for you faint of heart folks but anybody younger listening you'll find something you'll like there I'm sure okay so they can find all of that including Dr. Drew TV at drdrew.com yes right? yes but and if you we'll want those streaming shows it's better to go directly to drdrew.tv drdrw.tv yep. so we'll put all of this in the show notes thank you thank you and Send and watch for that people. show in January, man. That's What's it. the name of it? Uh, it's right now called uh, Special Forces, The Ultimate 
test. Ooh. I UT. saw you posted something about it. Yeah, they it follow is, you on social media at Dr. Dr. Drew. Dr. It's, a, it's a, at Dr. Drew on, on Twitter yeah, and uh, Dr. at Dr. Drew, Drew Pinsky on, on uh, Instagram. And the show is going to be on Fox. Fox Network. Like, I, and I think it's going to be following football, like the Super Bowl, oh, things like that. And it is it was such an intense experience. I'm not sure they can ever do it again. Really? It, it, you mean once we see what happened, no one will sign up? Not only will no one sign up, they'll wonder what's wrong with us for having done it, <laughs> number one. And and it, it is as dangerous as it looks. Wow. Uh, I, I, it is. Did you get I'm really glad I did it. shape? And... You know, I, I, and it still w- wasn't enough. I didn't last for I can't talk about it. But, right. But, but I was running hills, like really sprinting hills and running with packs on and oh weights. And, I, and it's how I got into it. They came to me and I was like, come on. And I go, where am I going, Utah or something? Yeah. They go, no, the Middle East. I'm like, oh, come on. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so then I started training because I was a little depressed then. I, I, yeah. COVID made me depressed. Yeah, I, like a lot I, of us. Not just for what part of my life was taken from me, but I, I was, I, to me, the symbol of loss was the businesses around Disneyland. Yeah. I kept going, Florida's open. Just yeah. open Disneyland yeah. a little bit. It's outside. Let those businesses come, come to life again. Yeah. It just depressed the hell out of me. Anyway, uh, so I started training and it gave me, elevated my mood and it got does. me focused on that. Maybe this That's is what That's another I, good advice. Move. Yes, physical, physical, physical activity. activity. Sleep and physical activity. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Watch out for all those things. Yeah. But anyway, I, I thought, oh, maybe this is what I need. I started, then I started fighting for it. Then I went and I, I am, I was by far the oldest person there. It is, it is a young person's competition. Yeah. <laughs> Let me just say that. I would all go right, again. Well, that's a so, testament. We'll so have to watch. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that and to seeing you sooner than two years yes. from now. Yes, Since please. relationships are so important. Please, please, please. That'd be great. Thank you for joining you us and for all you are in the world. Thank you. 